This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name. Together, this is the day. I dare you just to take a couple of moments. Now, I, I, I double dog dare you to take a couple of moments just to go ahead and, and glorify God in your own way. Take a moment to just praise God, thank God, give God the worship that God deserves. I, I, I dare you. I dare you. I know things aren't perfect in your life. I know we all have struggles and challenges, issues and problems, but God is still God and we are still here. I know, I know, I know things are, are not perfect, but what I do know is that someone didn't make it this week, but we did. I, I, I don't know. We, I, it wasn't because we were on our best behavior. I know that for a fact. I know it's not because we've been so good, because we've been so wonderful, but because of God's grace and God's mercy, we are here. And I said, listen, God, every time I have the opportunity to enter your presence, I'm going to do so with praise. Every time I have an opportunity to worship you, to thank you, to call on you, I'm going to do it because who knows if this might be my last time, my last chance, my last opportunity. I wonder what the praise would be like if we decided right now that we were going to praise God like we knew it was our last time. If we knew that this was the last time that we could say thank you, Lord. If we knew this was the last time that we could lift our hands. If we knew this was the last time for us to worship. What would we say? What would we do? God is worthy. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning to those who are streaming. Good morning to those who are gathered here in the building today. Today we celebrate or we continue to celebrate Women's Her Story Month. This month is all about amplifying the voices that have been silenced. This month is all about centering those stories that have been pushed to the margins. This month is all about highlighting the women whose contributions to society have been historically overshadowed, even in scripture, amen. So we continue our celebration. Last week we kicked off the month talking about the women behind the movement. So we're going to lift up one of those women today. If you can, join me in the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter. I'll read for your hearing verses 36 through 50. Listen to the words 
that are recorded. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in that city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. That she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one who, hold, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Remain standing while I pray. God, we are so grateful, so, 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 so grateful for who you are. We are so grateful that we are here. We are so grateful that you are here with us. Here with us in the building and here with every person who is watching and streaming our service today. We thank you, oh God, because this is the part of the service where we get to hear from you. God, we know that there is a word from the Lord and we are so grateful this morning because if there is anything that we need, we need a word from you. God, some of us have been struggling. Some of us have been wrestling. Some of us have been questioning. And all we want to know in this moment is what does God have to say about my questions and what does God have to say about my wrestling and what does God have to say about my struggle? God, we need a word from you today. This time, oh God, where people are grieving and hurting, this time of war, God, we need a word from you. So God, we're asking that you speak. Speak to us, meet us where we are. Speak, Our, your servants are listening. We're ready. We want to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, 
if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Family, for just a few moments this morning, I, I want to preach from the thought, don't count me out. Don't, don't count me out. On December 1st, 1955, a seamstress and activist by the name of Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a city bus in the segregated town of Montgomery, Alabama. Miss Parks' decision to remain seated that day not only led to her arrest, but also the Montgomery bus boycott, a movement that ended legal segregation in America. Now, most of us know the story of Rosa Parks. We grew up hearing the story of Rosa Parks, and most of us have had the privilege of learning about Rosa Parks in school. But what most of us don't know, what most of us haven't heard, and what most of us did not learn in school is that on March 2nd, 1955, nine months before Rosa's resistance, a 15-year-old high school student by the name of Claudette Colvin did the exact same thing. She refused to give up her seat on a crowded city bus. Colvin, who was a student at Booker T. Washington High School, was on her way home with three of her classmates after school. As was the law in Montgomery at the time, Colvin and her classmates paid their fare, stepped off the bus, and proceeded to the back entrance so that they could take their seat in the section reserved for colored passengers. While they were uh, on their way, the white section of the bus filled up quickly. Soon all of the seats in that section were taken, leaving one white woman standing. When he noticed this, the bus driver demanded that Colvin and her classmates, kids might I add, vacate their seats so that the white woman could sit. It was unlawful for blacks to sit on the same row as whites, so even though only one seat was needed, the entire row needed to vacate. As Colvin's classmate rose to do what they were told to do, Colvin remained seated. Years later, in an interview, Colvin was asked about why she refused to give up her seat that day and listen to what she said. She said, I couldn't move because history had me glued to the seat. Colvin explained that in school, she had been learning about African-American history and the U.S. Constitution. She said, when the driver asked me to get up, it felt like Sojourner Truth's hands were pushing me down on one shoulder and Harriet Tubman's hands were pushing me down on the other shoulder and I just couldn't move. She also said that she knew being asked to vacate her seat after she paid her fare, the same fare that the white passengers paid, she knew that was a violation of her constitutional rights. So Colvin remained seated that day, and as a result, the police were called. They dragged her off of that bus the entire time she was saying, I have constitutional rights. I have constitutional rights. She was placed in the squad car, handcuffed, brought to jail, and charged with three crimes. Disturbing the peace, breaking the segregation laws, and assaulting the officers who arrested her. 
Now, after hearing Claudette Colvin's story, everyone in this room and everyone watching the broadcast ought to have some questions. After hearing this story, all of you should be asking some questions. Okay, I'm the only one with the mic, so I'll ask them. If this happened nine months before Rosa, how is it that Rosa became a powerful symbol for the civil rights movement while Claudette disappeared into obscurity? If this happened nine months before Rosa, how did Rosa make the history books while Claudette's name remains largely unknown and her story rarely told? If this happened nine months before Rosa, why isn't Claudette celebrated in the same way as Rosa? After hearing Claudette's story, everyone ought to be raising some questions. Not because we want to take anything away from Rosa, because Rosa's rebellion deserves to be celebrated. She deserves all of the accolades that she has received. But we ask these questions because it is important to know and to understand how certain stories get included in his story and others do not. It is important for us to understand which stories get centered and which stories are pushed to the margins and why. So, so, so here is what we know about why Rosa became a prominent figure in the civil rights movement and Claudette did not. So the civil rights leaders at the time were very concerned about the image of the movement. If they were going to be taken seriously, they had to have the right person as the face of the movement. E.D. Nixon, one of the leaders at the time who served alongside a very young 26-year-old Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, E.D. Nixon is quoted as saying, we had to be sure that we had someone that we could win with. Direct quote. And here are some of the reasons why the male leaders of the civil rights movement back then felt that they couldn't win with Colvin. Some felt that Colvin was too dark and too poor for the white folks. Some felt that she was too young and too militant. But, 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 but see, the good news is that Colvin is still alive. And so, so she can tell her story, which is a good thing. So, so although I appreciated reading her story, what I appreciated more was being able to YouTube Colvin and hear in her own words what she had to say. And so, and so let me tell you what Colvin said. Here is what Colvin believes is the chief reason she was not asked to be the face of the movement. She says it was because of her, teen, because of her teenage pregnancy. A pregnancy, might I add, that was the result of a rape from an adult male at the time. It just gets deeper and deeper. The leaders of the movement were not willing to put an unwed, pregnant teenager as the face of the movement. They were more concerned about image, and let me just put on my Dyfus hat, than they were about protecting a 15-year-old baby who had been raped. I know. I know. The leaders of the movement counted, counted Colvin out because they were unwilling to put an unwed, pregnant teenager as the face of their movement. 
You see, Rosa Parks, on the other hand, Rosa was, was a successful seamstress who had several white clients. She was married. She was a Christian. She was the secretary of the NAACP. She was well-known. She was well-liked. She had an acceptable skin tone. And she had what some considered good hair. For the leaders, from their perspective, Rosa was the better choice. Here is what Claudette had to say about the matter in her own words. She said, they wanted someone mild and gentle like Rosa. Even if I had not been pregnant, the only difference between me and Rosa was that she was an adult in a lighter tone. Her words, black people at that particular time liked the lighter feature of women and men. And because of television, Rosa would make a good representative for both the poor and the middle class people. Her words. Claudette Colvin was the first person to be arrested for resisting Montgomery's segregation laws. Notice I didn't say she was the first person to resist Montgomery's segregation laws. Let me teach you. Before that, there were four other people that had tried, but instead of being arrested, they were beaten and or killed. So Colvin, a 15-year-old baby carrying a baby of her own refused to give up her seat and she was the first person who wasn't beaten or killed. She was the first person to be arrested for resisting Montgomery's segregation laws. Claudette put her life on the line, her body on the line, her unborn baby on the line. She boldly took a stand against injustice and might I add, it was Claudette who paved the way for Rosa. But listen, because she did not fit society's image, acceptable image, she was counted out and her story was written out of his story. For centuries, family, women, bold women, brave women, bad women, women who put their lives and their bodies on the line, but whose names and contributions have been counted out. Women whose stories have been written out because they did not fit into his story. This is why Women's History Month is so important. Because those stories that have been left out of his story need to be told. Now, this is a, a, a good place to enter our text this morning. Because like Claudette, the unnamed woman in our passage knows what it's like to be counted out because you don't fit in. Let me provide some context for you so that you understand what is happening in the text. Jesus had been invited to the home of Simon the Pharisee. He had been invited there for dinner. And in first century Palestine, it was common practice for respected members of the community to host dinners in their homes and invite the social and the religious elite to have dinner with an important guest. At these formal dinners, they would recline at the table. They would eat and discuss the crucial issues of the day. 
social issues, political issues, religious issues, being sure to pay particular attention to the thoughts, views, and opinions of the special dinner guest. I remember when Oprah Winfrey did something similar. She would invite a, a, a special guest to come to her home for dinner, and then she would invite regular old folks, some folks from her book club, and, and they had an opportunity to talk with the author of the book or talk with the special guest. It was something very similar to this. Simon invites Jesus to his home to be his special guest. But it becomes clear that Simon does not have Jesus over because he is interested in Jesus' social, political, or religious views. You see, Jesus at this point in the text was kind of a big deal. He had made his presence known. He had built up a following. His teachings were controversial. He was doing things that no one else was doing. You know, stuff like healing the sick and raising the dead and stilling the storm and forgiving the sins and, and, and multiplying two fish and five loaves of bread. And everybody was talking about Jesus. Jesus was a big deal. Jesus was a big thing. And Simon invites Jesus over not to hear his views, but because Simon just wants the big thing, the big deal at his house. Simon had an agenda. He wanted to increase his visibility in the community. He just wanted to have Jesus over to promote his agenda. He wanted to solidify his importance. Look who I got at my house. We also know this is true because Simon doesn't extend to Jesus any of the common courtesies that a respectable host would offer a guest in their home. Simon didn't offer Jesus the kiss of peace that was customary, nor did he remove Jesus' sandals and wash his feet. Nor did Simon anoint Jesus' head with oil. Simon did not extend to Jesus any of the common courtesies that should have been extended because Jesus was the guest of honor in Simon's house. But how many of you know that's okay? That's okay because you know, uh, 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 how many of you know that, that what you won't do for Jesus, somebody else will? What I've come to learn in my life is that one person will never stop God's show. God always has a ram in the bush. So if you won't do it, if you won't stand, if you won't speak, if you won't serve, if you won't teach, if you won't lead, if you won't sing, if you won't step up, if you won't go, that's okay. Because God always has somebody waiting in the wing who will gladly step up and do what you won't. One monkey don't stop God's show. There's always somebody ready and willing to step in what you and do what you won't do. We see that in the text. Simon refused to honor Jesus, but that's okay because there was a woman who did. Jesus is sitting in Simon's home, reclining at Simon's table, and a woman walks in. She doesn't have a name, but she is described in the text as a sinner in that town. She walks up behind Jesus and she washes his feet with her tears. She dries them with her hair. She anoints him with oil. This woman does all of the things that Simon refused to do. And you would think that Simon would be grateful. You would think that Simon would be appreciative. That he would thank this woman for doing the things that he should have done in his house. But listen, instead of thanking her, the text says that Simon begins to criticize her, to judge her, look down on her. Listen to what Simon says about her. Simon says, 
If this man referring to Jesus were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is and who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now, when I look at what Simon, with Simon's criticism of this woman, this woman, I have two things that I want to raise. First of all, how does Simon, a respected Pharisee, a, a member of the religious elite, a man who prides himself on being righteous, a man who claims to be oh so holy, how is it that Simon knows what kind of woman this is? Maybe Sai Sai knows firsthand what kind of woman she is. Maybe Sai Sai knows this woman's sin because he's guilty of the same sin. How come? No, no. Why come? Why come? Why come your biggest critics? who criticize you and, and your lifestyle and, and how you live, why come the, your biggest critics are always the people who are guilty of doing what you do, but they haven't been caught yet? Why come? So that's first. How is it that Sasai, Pharisee, holy and righteous, how, how, how does Sasai know what kind of woman this is? The second thing is this, why? Listen, everybody telling me to come on when they come for me. Y'all better protect, you better put your body on the line. I read Simon's criticism of her. If, if, if Jesus knew who this was that was touching him, that, that she was a sinner. I read this, and, my, and, and the first thing that pops in my mind, the second thing that pops into my mind is, why do men become so critical of women who step up and do the things they didn't want to do? We see this all throughout history. Let's go back to the Colvin thing for one second. One of the things, Karen, that angers me about the Claudette Colvin story is that this young girl, this baby, carrying a baby, risks her life, stands up for her convictions. She is arrested, charged. That took big guts for a little girl. But instead of, of receiving the accolades and the recognition, instead of being thanked and celebrated for what she did, the leaders of the movement criticized this little girl. Now, now here is why this makes me so angry. Because at any point, Robin, any one of those leaders could have boarded a city bus, refused to give up their seat, they could have gotten arrested, they could have been charged. They could have become the face of the movement. But none of them were willing to do that. Yet they criticized the girl who did. Why come? Why come? They, they could have easily have been the one to do this. But they weren't. Our biggest critics are sometimes the very ones who won't do what you are willing to do. And we see that in the text. We see that in the, in the Colvin story. These men criticized this baby. They counted her out because she didn't fit in. Despite what Colvin had done, the sacrifice she made, Colvin was reduced to a poor, dark, unwed, pregnant teenager when what she did was so much more. We see Simon do the very same thing in our text. Simon counts this woman out because she didn't fit in. 
despite the fact that this woman honors Jesus in ways that Simon did not. She is reduced to being a sinner in that town. Simon doesn't know this woman's name, but he knows her sin. Folks will count you out. They don't know your name. They don't know who you are. They don't know your story. They don't know your convictions, but they know your sin. They don't know your name is Jessica, but they know you can't keep a job. They don't know your name is Pat, but they know all about your past. People will count you out and don't know a thing about you. They just count you out because of what they think they know about you. And we see that. We see that in the text. And I wonder today, uh, I wonder this Women's History Month, how many women throughout history have stepped up to do things that no one else wanted to do, but we don't know their names. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they've done because they were counted out because their stories have been reduced. People saw their sin, but they didn't acknowledge them. I wonder how many women's stories got erased from his story because they didn't fit society's image, because they didn't fit in. Well, today, family, I encourage you, let's begin today to celebrate women, women like Claudette Colvin and the unnamed woman in our text who said, listen, you may have counted me out, but I'm coming anyway. You may have counted me out, but I'm coming anyway. This woman in our text knew that Simon and all his friends and everyone gathered at the party that night. She knew that they had all counted her out. But she showed up anyway. She honored Jesus anyway. She said, you may have counted me out. But I'm coming anyway. Anybody ever walk into a job, walk into a meeting, walk into a church, and you knew that everybody in there was counting you out, but you showed up anyway? You took your place at the table anyway? You spoke up anyway? Yeah. Then you know what it's like to be this woman in the text. She showed up where Jesus was knowing full well that nobody wanted her there, but she showed up anyway. Today, family, we celebrate all the women who said, I know they don't want me here, but I'm coming anyway. I know I wasn't invited, but I'm crashing the party anyway. I know they didn't reserve a seat for me, but I brought my own anyway. Excuse me. Excuse me, let me set up my seat. I'm here anyway. They counted me out, but I'm coming. I'm coming. I, they counted me out, but I'm showing up anyway. When I think about all the women who made the decision to show up anyway, I think about women like Sojourner Truth, who at a women's rights convention in 1852 started to make her way to the front to speak. But when the white women saw that she was coming forward, they tried to push her back. They said, no, 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 don't let her speak. Because the last thing they wanted was for this tall, black woman to speak at their convention but let me tell you what mama sojourner did so mama sojourner said uh-uh i'm coming anyway i know you don't want me to speak but i'm speaking anyway i know you don't want me at the front but i'm moving to the front anyway i know you don't want me here you counted me out but i'm coming anyway sojourner truth not only showed up but she spoke out and and she said, look, I'm not going to let any of you, white men, white men, white women, black men, count me out. Ain't I a woman? And 
because Sojourner's decision to come anyway, because she decided that, listen, they may count me out, but I'm showing up anyway. Because of that decision, she paved the way for Shirley Chisholm, who a century later in 1968 became the first black woman elected to the U.S. Congress and the first woman to run for the president of the United States. Shirley Caesar said, listen, I know they don't want me in Congress, but I'm coming anyway. And then she famously said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair because they may not want you here, but you got to come anyway. You may count me out, but I'm coming anyway. And listen, look how this thing works. Sojourner's decision paved the way for Shirley, and Shirley's decision paved the way for Kamala, who last week we heard her say in her own words, she acknowledged on the world stage that she is standing on the shoulders of women, women like Shirley Caesar, women like Sojourner Truth, women who came before her. Yes, because Sojourner decided to show up anyway. It made space for Shirley, and because Shirley decided to show up anyway, it made space for Kamala. Listen, even when they count you out, come anyway, show up anyway, run anyway, teach anyway, Preach anyway, lead anyway, speak anyway, stand anyway. Because when people count you out, Jesus counts you in. I'm sure, I'm sure that when Simon finalized the count for his dinner party, the woman in this text didn't make the count. But that's okay, because how many of you know that Jesus was the guest of honor? And when everyone at the party counted her out, Jesus said, count her in, she's with me. When, when, when Simon finalized the count, when, when he didn't, I know that, that he didn't count on the fact that, that, that this woman would be here. But what he didn't count when he counted her out was he didn't count Jesus. He forgot to factor Jesus into the equation so his count was off. You see how that worked? See, Simon counted her out, um, but what he didn't count on was Jesus. And so he forgot to factor Jesus into the equation, and so his count was off. It threw his count off. Uh, what, I want, what I want you to understand today is that when people try to count you out, just remember that their count is off. When, when, when people count you out, remember that their count is off. When, when people try to count you out, the only thing that they factor in to the equation are the things that they can see. In Claudette's case, she was counted out because all the people counted was what they could see. They, they looked at her and they, they saw her age, okay, her age, uh, uh, plus her skin tone, uh, plus her hair, pl plus her gender, plus her poverty, plus her, her pregnancy. And, and when they added all those things up to them, uh, 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 it, it didn't match. It didn't equal much. It, it, it didn't equal much at all. They, they said, listen, her, her age and, 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 and her gender and, and her teenage pregnancy and, and she's not married and and, and she's a woman, and, and, and they added all of that stuff up, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and, and, and it didn't add up to much, so they, they counted her out. But how many of you know that in every algebraic expression, there is always a variable whose value is unknown? I, I, I'm not good at math, I'm not, I'm not. But what I do know is that in every equation, there are the numbers we can see, Five, four, three, two, one, and then there are the variables, the X and the Y. And we don't know the variables, but we do know is that the variable will change the value of the equation. 
When people count us out, they are counting the fours, the sixes, the sevens, and the eights. They're counting what they can see. But what most people can't see is that Jesus is our why. That Jesus is our variable. And when we factor Jesus into the equation, it changes the value of the whole expression. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody watching who can say they counted me out? Because when they looked at me, they counted and said my gender plus my skin tone plus my race. They counted what they can see and it didn't add up to much. My sin plus my past plus my mistakes plus my failures plus that time I fell. Plus that time I lied. They looked at all of that. And they said two plus carry the one divided by the four times the two. Oh, no, 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 no. That don't add up to much. And they were able to count me out. But what they didn't count on was Jesus. When Jesus is your why, he makes all things possible. When Jesus is your why, the things that don't add up to people, huh, oh, they add up for God. You see, 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 something, something is off about God's man. You see, see, we, we can do all the work. We can get our little scratch paper and our pen, and we can add the two and the four and carry the three and the five, and we can get one answer. But then God comes in and says, hmm, change the entire equation. Why? Because God's math is just different. It's just different. I mean, when we talk about God's math, check this out. You got two fish, you got five loaves of bread. You got two fish, you got five loaves of bread. Now, according to my calculation, that's some tuna fish sandwiches. But when God is solving the equation, two fish and five loaves of bread can feed 5,000. I mean, that math just doesn't add up. When people count us out, they, they look at, at what they can see. But see, what they don't see is that God is for us. And my Bible says that when God is for you, any, any Bible readers in the house? When God is for you, it's more than the world against you. So it may look like me and God is just two. But when you're talking about God's math, here is what God's math can do. God's math can take a little boy, a slingshot, and a stone and slay a Goliath. God's math can take Pharaoh, his army, mountains on either side. The Red Sea, two, four, carry the one, that equals dead. But in God's math, God can split the waters, allowing them to cross over to the other side. All I know is that God's math is different. So don't let anybody count you out. Because they don't know your why. They don't know that Jesus is with you and that if Jesus is with you it doesn't matter how your math got to where you are God can and God will move you to where he needs you to be they counted Claudette out but Jesus was her why let me tell you how this story ends, because I didn't finish. You know Claudette is still alive and well, 82 years young, doing interviews all over the place, telling her story because his story left her out. So they counted her out back in 1955. But in 2021, let me tell you how God worked that equation out. Despite being counted out, two months into the boycott, her attorney, Fred Gray, approached her about a civil lawsuit that would become the Browder versus Gale case. The ruling, which was taken all the way to the Supreme Court, 
found that bus segregation was unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. Coven's name is listed as one of the four plaintiffs. She went all the way to the Supreme Court, and even though the leaders counted her out, she still gave testimonies just a few months after giving birth to her son, Raymond. Forever in history, her name will be listed on that case. Listen, they counted her out, but they can't take away the fact that her name will forever be on that, that case. Despite being counted out, Claudette graduated from college. She raised her family. And despite being counted out on November 24th, 2021, at 82 years old, an Alabama family court granted Colvin's petition to expunge her record. That's good news, right? But I got even better news. The judge who granted Colvin's motion was a black judge by the name of Calvin Williams. You talk about full circle. This little black girl who was arrested, thrown into jail, and had been charged, and she had been living as a juvenile delinquent for, for all of this time, her record is expunged by a black judge named Calvin. They counted her out. Calvin restored her and counted her back in. Her motion even had the support of the Montgomery D County District Attorney, Daryl Bailey, who called Colvin's actions in 1955. Listen to what he said. Conscious, not criminal. Inspired, not illegal. They should have led to praise and not prosecution. Colvin may have been counted out back then, but today she is getting the recognition she deserves. Don't count me out. Somebody say, don't count me out.